So um, we uh, paused last week uh, in our uh, study of matters Masoretic uh, with the introduction of the Ta'ameh HaMikra. So I want to pick up from there before we move into uh, some uh, things that I've called uh, Masoretic anomalies. So first of all, the Ta'ameh HaMikra. Um, for some reason, I, I really don't know where it originated, um, Tamei HaMikra are better known amongst Ashkenazim as Trup. So uh, the best that I could come up with is the definition you see on the bottom of the screen, courtesy actually the Oxford English Dictionary, which uh, carries what it calls an obsolete definition of trope uh, as being a manner of playing music, a mode or harmonization. So clearly at some, whatever point in time that Trup became the equivalent of Tameh HaMikra, it, it had a recognizable association with things that are musical. In any event, if you look at the four words that are on the screen, we can distinguish through the use of colors between the, uh, the tinuot, the vowel signs, and the tameh hamikra, the punctuation marks. What you see in red are the vowel signs, the vocalization. That tells us how those different consonants are to be pronounced. What you see in blue are the tameh hamikra, the punctuation marks, which tell us, um, which give us the, the, the um, uh, understanding uh, of how the words associate with one another which words are to be read uh, in conjunction with each other, as opposed to which words are to be kept separate from each other. So um, one of the earliest um, observations that we have on the use of Tameh HaMikra comes to us courtesy of Rashi. Uh, Rashi, uh, in his commentary on the Talmud, actually uh, sticks the following comment in there. He talks about something he calls niginot ta'ame mikra shel Torah, the musical notations of the Torah, nevi'im uktuvim, right, that exist also for books of nevi'im and ketuvim, bein benikud sheba sefer, whether they're actually written, obviously not in a Torah scroll, but in what we already know to call a codex, okay? Uh, so whether these Tameh HaMikra are actually recorded in writing in a codex, Bain, or alternatively, if they're part of an oral tradition, which Rashi calls Hagbahat Kol, raising one's voice, Uvitziltzul Ni'imot Hanigina or the tzilzul, literally the ringing. So you see that I've used the rather fancy word, tintinabulation, ni'imot uh, of the recitation. And he names four of the tameh hamikra. Pashta, darga, shofar, mahapach. Now, we know what these are when they're part of the written tradition. But how do you recognize them <clears throat> in an oral tradition? So Rashi makes the following observation. He says, Molich yado lefitaam hanigina, that one moves one's hand according to the notations, according to the ta'amim. And Rashi adds that it was not a custom in Ashkenaz. But he says, Ra'iti, that he has witnessed this practice, Bekorim Habaim Me Eretz Yisrael. That Torah readers who grew up and who learned their trade, so to speak, in the land of Israel would have these hand motions that accompanied the Tameh HaMikra. Uh, I've seen that uh, myself. Uh, you, some of you, may have seen it as well. It only 
it is only uh, can be observed in uh, very rare situations. We had an opportunity uh, last week to point out that uh, Yemenite Jews preserve in their synagogues uh, some very, very old traditions that have been lost elsewhere. The example that we gave last week is the incorporation of the public reading of the Aramaic Targum accompanying the public reading of the Torah. That just as seems to have been during the time of Ezra and during the time of the Talmud, the Torah reader pauses at the end of every sentence, while somebody else then reads the Aramaic Targum of that verse. So this is a reference, what Rashi is referring to here, and which Rashi associates with Torah readers from the land of Israel, is also something that one can still observe in certain Yemenite congregations. And that is as follows. Certain Yemenite congregations still preserve the tradition that a person who is called to the Torah is expected to read his own portion. That means that this, these Yemenite congregations do not have what just about everybody else has, and that is professional ba'ale kriya, right? People who read the Torah, you know, professionally, professionally, avocationally, but the people who read the Torah so that in an ordinary congregation, it doesn't matter whether it's Ashkenaz or Sephard, a person is called to the Torah, the person recites the brachot for and aft, but the actual Torah reading is conducted by this professional, okay? In these Yemenite congregations, and there are very few of them, a person is called to the Torah, and in addition to reciting the brachot before and after, the person reads the portion to which he was called. Now, I, I suppose that if you're a Kohen or a Levi, so you have a reasonably good idea of what Torah portion you might be called to, so you can actually prepare in advance. But if you're an ordinary Jew, you might be called to any one of several different Torah portions. So how in the world do you know what you're going to be called to? So the answer that they came up with is that the person who in other congregations would be the Torah reader, the Baal Kriya, stands alongside the Torah scroll during the reading. And just like a first base or third base coach in baseball, right, makes certain signals with his hands, with his fingers or with the movements of his hand, and those signals alert the Torah reader to what the Ta'ameha Mikra are. And this is apparently the custom that Rashi observed amongst what he calls Korim Habaim Eretz Yisrael, because he describes as Molich Yado Lefi Ta'am Hanegina, that the person would move his hand in keeping with the trap. Okay. Here is an example out of the very beginning of the Torah of a book that was made in order to facilitate preparation for Torah reading. It's called a tikkun, tikkun kore or tikkun korim. And what you see here is a printed text of the Torah, complete with the vowels and the punctuation marks on the right-hand side of the page. And the corresponding text, as it would appear in an actual Torah scroll, no vowels and no punctuation marks on the left-hand side of the page. Therefore, somebody who knows what Torah portion he has to read, or somebody who is a Baal Kriya and reads the Torah portion regularly, can test his accuracy in both the vocalization and punctuation. 
And while there are slight variations in classifying or cataloging these punctuation marks, they are generally divisible into five categories. And I've listed them here in descending order of strength, meaning the Kesarim or emperors are the most emphatic pauses they are the self pasuk, the end of a sentence, or et nachta, a large pause in the middle of a sentence. The second category are called melachim, kings, and there is a list of the uh, ta'amim, of the uh, punctuation marks in that category. Below the melachim are sarim, also known in some cases as mishnim. The fourth category is the shalishim, and the lowest category are the misharutim, the servants. So here on the next two slides is basically a primer. Um, all you really need to know about Ta'ame HaMikra. Uh, I've highlighted two things in it. The, uh, the primer itself, uh, for those of you who We'll look later on at the uh, at the recording so you can see it then, or you can make a copy of it. Um, otherwise, uh, I simply lifted it uh, from um, the book that I've been following since we began these uh, classes, my book on Tanakh and Owner's Manual. Um, I highlighted two portions of it. One, as you see here, is called continuous dichotomy. And this is a very important principle in biblical syntax, and it governs the Tameha Mikra. Continuous dichotomy means that every single biblical verse is divided into two parts, and then each part is subdivided into another two parts, and the process continues until no subdivision contains more than two words, okay? Hence, dichotomy, splitting things in half, continuous dichotomy that we continue splitting until we get to the lowest common denominator of a biblical verse, which is a clause or a phrase that consists of no more than two words. Also, please keep in mind, that for this purpose, hyphenated words count as a single word, okay? So here, for example, is one of the early psukim in Breshet, okay? The pasuk reads, Vayar Elohim et haor, that's hyphenated, okay? Et haor, kitov, also hyphenated. Vayavdel Elohim ben haor uvein hachoshech. So let's start with the first dichotomy, the first and major division within a verse is indicated by a change of subject or a change of action. So here we have, Vayar Elohim et or Kitov, God saw the light. And then the action, the verb changes, Vayavdel Elohim, God divided or separated the light from the darkness. So the point at which we have a change of subject or a change of action is the greatest, the largest pause within a verse. And that is governed by, the, uh, by one of the Kesarim, one of the emperors, the one called an etnachta. The word etnachta itself is Aramaic, but in it you can recognize the word lanuach or the word menucha. It means a rest or a pause, okay? So now we have the pasug divided in half. Now I'm on point B, if you're following me in this paragraph, we subdivide each of the two major parts into subunits of no more than two words each. So vayar Elohim et haor kitov is four words. So we have to divide this into units of no more than two words each. And that divides, as you see, into vayar Elohim, that's the subject and the verb, God saw, et haor, right? 
that's the object of the verb, and kitov is either an adverb modifying the God's looking or it's an adjective modifying the light, okay? Then the second half of the verse, Fayabdel Elohim, again, the subject and the verb go together. Bein ha'or uvein ha'choshech, two words to distinguish between or to separate the light from the darkness, okay? Now, um, the next part is obviously one only for, um, for uh, big fans or aficionados of Tameh HaMikra, because it isn't something that ordinary Torah readers engage in. For an ordinary Torah reader, it should be enough to know that the etnachta, the great pause in the Pasuk follows Kitov, and that in reading the second half of the verse, one should say, Vayabdel Elohim, Ben Ha'or, slight pause, Uven Ha'choshech, period, okay? Uh, the parsing of the sentence, that you see in the schematic at the bottom of the slide, as I said, is, is certainly optional for people who are just preparing a Torah reading, but it helps to understand and it occasionally also gives you insight into the proper interpretation of the verse. So what you see here is first of all, we've taken each of the two major portions of the verse, and each one is now enclosed with its own little box, okay? So that you see that Vayar Elohim et or Kitov, all is under the same umbrella, so to speak. And that within that larger box, we've taken the beginning, Vayar Elohim et or the subject, the verb, and the direct object of the verb. And we've placed them under a smaller umbrella and kept them separate from Kitov. While in the second half of the verse, right, we've taken the subject and the verb, okay, and we've kept it separate from what could be the two direct objects of the verb. The second principle of trop of Tameha Mikra is one that we've already seen illustrated, but here it's just presented formally. And that is that there is a hierarchy amongst the Tameha Mikra. And we've already taken note of the fact that the end of a complete sentence is marked by the highest order of uh, uh, punctuation mark, which is known either as a siluk or a sof pasuk, okay? And its symbol is a vertical line. If you look at the model, right, just below it, you can see that underneath the word hachoshech, right, is that single vertical line. Should also point out that there are four letters in the word hachoshech beneath, beneath which one would the, is, is the, uh, the self-pasuk placed? It's placed beneath that consonant that carries the accent of the word. So since the word is ha -cho -shech, right, then the proper place for this uh, punctuation mark is be below the letter chet. If the punctuation mark were one that goes above the letters rather than below it. If you look a bit to the right, Vayavdel Elohim, so you see the two dots above the letter He, okay? So that too, Vayavdel Elohim, that is the, the letter, or if you wish, the, the um, uh, Havara, um, the, uh, the syllable, thank you. The syllable, right? Uh, the accented syllable. So here, the ta'am goes above rather than below. So then again, one of the other functions that the tameha mikra serve, in addition to punctuation and in addition to musical notation, is that it's also a, uh, a, an unerring guide to proper pronunciation. Okay. If you want to know how to read a biblical verse properly, how to properly pronounce the words, which words are mila'el, where the accent is toward the beginning of the word, or which words are mila'ra, where the accent is towards the end of the word, okay, 
then an unerring guide is to simply look at each word and to see where the um, where the trap is placed. Okay. A lot more to be said about this, but these, as I said, are the two uh, most important principles. So with that, we can move now to what I've called Masoretic anomalies. Certain features of the Masoretic text that are unusual, or if you wish, and pardon me, anomalous. Starting with kre and ketiv. Kre, from the word to read, means the way a word is pronounced. Ketiv, from the word lichtov, to write, means the way a word is written. Occasionally in Tanakh, a word may be written and spoken in two different ways. And Rabbi David Kimchi Radak, who lived in Provence in the 13th century, and who, in addition to being a grammarian and a uh, biblical exegete, also uh, wrote a manual for scribes, and therefore had a keen interest in all matters Masoretic, gives us in tucked away in his commentary in the book of Samuel uh, is uh, an insight into how it came to pass that there are certain words in the Bible that might be written and read two different ways. And this explanation is a simple historical one. He says that it appears that during the first exile, that would be the Babylonian exile, Whatever Torah scrolls or Bible texts that were considered authoritative during the first temple period were themselves either lost or moved. Right? But either way, the sages, right, the people who knew those texts intimately and might have been able to reproduce them from memory, died. Therefore, when at the beginning of the second temple period, the Anshei Knesset Agdola, the men of the great assembly, who tried to restore the Torah text to its previous glory. So they, they gathered whatever Torah and Bible scrolls they could, but they found that there were differences amongst the remaining scrolls. They weren't all identical. So what process did they follow? They followed a halachic process of majority rules, right? Therefore, if a clear majority of the scrolls had one reading, as opposed to a different reading in a minority of the scrolls, then they just simply followed the majority reading. However, the Radak says, there were occasions when they were unable to make a determination. Clearly then, maybe the distribution amongst texts did not produce a clear majority. So they were left with the fact that there were two different ways in which a biblical verse had been written. So what did they do? He says that they did one of three things. They either wrote one word, but they didn't vocalize it. And the fact that they didn't vocalize it would call attention to the fact that they were uncertain about it. Or they wrote one, they wrote the word in the margin of the text, but not in the body of the text, which was another way of saying that they were unsure about whether it was correct. Or the most common one, the one that we call kreukative. It's not one or the other, something that's written but not read or read but not written, okay? And that is where they wrote one of the two versions in the margin and the other of the two versions in the text itself. And here are several examples, okay? On the right-hand side of the page, of the text from again Breshit Perek Yod Aleph, we have the names of the kings of the five towns. Okay, 
uh, the king of Sodom, the king of Amora, the king of Shinab, the king of Adma, and the fifth town in the text itself is spelled Tzadi Vet Yod Yod Mem. If I were to be asked to vocalize that, I would say Tzviyim, Tzvoyim, okay? But you see that in the margin of the text, the word is not only spelled differently, but it's given a very clear vocalization. And that tells us that the word is to be read tsevoyim. So clearly, according to Radak, this is an instance in which Ezra and the members of the Great Assembly found that some Torah scrolls said tsevoyim, other Torah scrolls said tsevoyim, and this is the way in which they figured out how to preserve both um, of the alternatives. Same on the left-hand side of the page, an earlier passage in Bereshit, where the word is spelled hey vav tzadi aleph, which I would read as ho tzay. And the marginal note tells me, again, it alters the spelling and the pronunciation, telling me that it should be read hai tzay rather than ho tzay. And here, on a page from the second book of Samuel, chapter 13 and 14, are actually, you can see there are several such instances of Cray and Ketiv on one page. There are, in fact, more such instances in books of Nevi'im and Ketuvim than there are in the Torah, arguably because greater care was exercised by copyists, by scribes in copying Torah texts than in copying texts of Nevi'im or Ketuvim. But let's just simply look at the first one here because it's a double whammy, so to speak. Notice that the word as it's written inside the text is spelled ayin mem yod chet vav resh. While in the margin, the chet has become a hey and the resh has become a dalet. Now, you may remember from last week when we did some uh, work on the alphabet, we noted that there are certain letters of the alphabet which, because they are very similar to each other, often get confused one for another. And here we have two such letters, the letter He and the letter Chet, which are nearly identical, and the letters Dalit and Resh that are nearly identical. So sometimes the reason behind a Krayan Ktiv might simply be a scribal problem. I can't tell. Is that a hey? Is that a chet? Is that a dalit? Is that a resh? Or on other occasions, there could be other reasons for it. The second Masoretic anomaly are the so-called floating dots. Here is again a text from Sefer Breshit. It's describing uh, uh, Jacob's reunion with his brother Esau, okay? And looking at the right-hand side of the page where we can read it because it has both the vowels and the punctuation marks, it says, Vayarotz Esav likrato vayachab bekehu. Esau ran towards Jacob and embraced him. Vayipol al tzavarav vayishakehu. And he fell on his neck or on his shoulders and he kissed him. Arguably, again, it's still Esau. Esau fell on Jacob's neck and kissed him. Vayivku, and both of them burst into tears. So notice that both in the printed text, but more remarkably in the Torah text itself, in the left hand column, the letters of the word vayishakehu have dots over them. And these dots are old enough they, that, the, that the early the sources, the Talmud and the Midrash speculate as to what purpose they serve. The Jerusalem Talmud says, wherever the dotted letters are in the minority in a particular word, then, Meaning, if there are more letters in a word that don't have dots, then there are letters then that have dots, 
then focus on the letters without the dots and ignore the dots, okay? Or vice versa. Whenever the dotted letters are in the majority, focus on the dotted letters and ignore the letters without dots. So arguably then, what's the purpose of the dots? The purpose of the dots is to call attention to something, okay? The Avot Rabbi Natan, a relatively early Midrash, has a different take on the floating dots. According to the Midrash, okay, Ezra, when we just noted a moment ago, right, was stood at the head of the attempt to restore biblical texts to their original accuracy, okay, why did Ezra put dots over certain letters? Ezra said, if Elijah, that would be the Elijah the prophet, should eventually say, why did you write those letters? I mean, they don't belong there, they're a mistake. I shall say to him, I put dots over them. Meaning, according to this Midrash, the function of the dot is not to call attention to something, but rather it's a mark of erasure. Therefore, if Elijah were to say to Ezra, these letters are a mistake, Ezra will say, God, Sir Duncan, thank goodness, I put dots over them, okay? However, if Elijah should say just the opposite, he should say, those letters are correct. No big deal, says Ezra, what'll I do? I'll simply take out my trusty eraser and I'll erase the dots. So we see that there are two different approaches to the function of, uh, in the early sources, to the function of the dots. Interestingly, modern scholars have pointed out that the same dotted notation, called a diplay, was used by Greek manuscript copiers in the Hellenistic period to mark questionable parts of a text, pretty much like the Midrash seems to say. The custom first developed in Alexandria, which was a great center of Jewish learning as well. And the speculation is that it was borrowed from the Greeks by Jewish Torah scribes, right? Um, and if you look on the bottom, uh, the late professor Saul Lieberman who wrote a book called Hellenism in Jewish Palestine about things Hellenistic as they are reflected in early um, Mishnaic and Talmudic sources noted that dots were sometimes used by Greek copyists not to question the authenticity of something, but rather just as we saw in the passage from the Talmud Yerushalmi to tell the reader to pay special attention to it, much as today we might use either italics or put an exclamation point in brackets. And here's an example. Okay, that's the word that we saw in the Torah text with the dots above it, Vayisha uh, describing Esau's um, uh, hugging and kissing Jacob. And here's the commentary of Rashi. Rashi says, V'yesh cholkim bedavar, that there are different opinions about the function of the dots. Yesh lomar, there are those who understand the function of the dots to mean, shelo nishako bechol that the reason that they put dots over it was to tell you there's something, it's a, it's a note of skepticism, right? It's to tell you there's something, you know, a little fishy about this. That yes, maybe if you were filming it, you saw Esau kissing Jacob on his cheek. But we know that this was only an external sign, but it really wasn't wholehearted, okay? While the alternative interpretation is that, no, quite to the contrary, the dots are there as exclamation points to tell you that at this moment, Esau was so moved by Jacob's treatment of him that on this occasion, he really did hug and kiss him wholeheartedly. So we see that in the Jewish exegetical tradition, we've seen both approaches taken. One that says there's something might be there's something uh, odd about these letters, they may not belong. And another one that says, no, quite to the contrary, it's to call attention to them. The next phenomenon are 
uh, one size doesn't fit all. There are a number of occasions, both in the Torah as well as in other books of the Bible, where letters are either larger than usual, smaller than usual, or incomplete. So here we have an example of each. The very first letter of the Torah, the bet of the word breshit, is larger than usual. It's called an ot rabati. The technical term for it is majuscule. In the second chapter of Bereshit, we have the word bihi baraam, in which the letter he is smaller than usual. Technical term for it is minuscule. And in towards the end of the book of Bimidbar, in describing the covenant, uh, the covenant uh, of Kihuna that God granted to Pinchas, uh, uh, the son of Elazar, it's called a Brit Shalom, and the vav of the word Shalom is incomplete. It's called uh, an Ot Ketua, an interrupted letter. As you can see, the vav right has a break in the middle. Okay. Here is a completely different phenomenon. It's a floating letter, or if you wish, a letter in suspension. Okay. In the 18th chapter of the book of Shofetim, Judges, there's a story about somebody named Micha who, uh, who erected a pestle, an idol, uh, that became a, a thorn in the side of the people of Israel. And it says that the children of Dan erected this pestle, this idol, and they hired people to be its kohanim, its priests. And it names the, the principal kohen of this idol, Yehonatan ben Gershom ben Menashe. But notice oddly that the nun of the word Menashe is not on the same line as the rest of it. And therefore the question is, why was it put into suspension, so to speak? So take a moment and consider what would the word be if the nun weren't there? Do you know a proper noun in Hebrew that's spelled mem shin he? Well, I certainly do, little humor there, of course, right? Right? It would be Moshe. So take a look at, again, how the Talmud Yerushalmi interprets that uh, suspended nun. He says, nun talui, that the nun is suspended to tell us, im zacha, that if this Yonatan ben Gershom would actually become a, a meritorious, meaning if he would repent and he would abandon the practice of idolatry, then he would be remembered as a descendant of Moses, which he was, okay? Otherwise, if however he persisted in his function as a priest to a forbidden idol, then the nun would remain and he would be considered the son of Menashe. That means that his relationship to Moses would be obscured. The last one that I want to look at, I think, are the inverted nuns. Okay. Um, you recognize the words, right? Okay. Um, these two verses, and this is, as you see, this is out of the Torah text itself. Okay. So not only again in the printed text, but in the Torah scroll itself, these two psukim are set off both fore and aft by an inverted nun or backwards nun. Now, if backwards nuns kind of looked like, look like square brackets, that indeed seems to be the function that they served. And again, Saul Lieberman in his book, Hellenism in Jewish Palestine, brings uh, uh, evidence of the use of these marks, sigla, by uh, Hellenistic scribes. Um, 
But what function do they serve? The Babylonian Talmud in Masechet Shabbat explains as follows, okay? Tanur Rabbanan, the sages taught us that the Holy One, blessed is he, made signs, right? Simanim, for this portion, for these two biblical verses, milma'ala um, ulamata, right? Fore and aft, why? To teach us lomar she'en zemekoma. Right? That they don't really belong here. They interrupt the flow, the narrative flow. Okay, that means that I've got to come up with an explanation of why the narrative flow was interrupted. Okay, and most of the exegetes say because what precedes it is a description of one of the many times in which the children of Israel misbehaved. What follows it is an instance of misbehavior, and therefore the purpose of the of the interruption was to simply give us a pause, right, to reflect on the two instances that preceded and followed it. Okay, so this is one interpretation. However, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi disagreed, and he said, no, that's not the function of the, uh, of the um, um, upside down nuns, but rather it's to indicate that this is Sefer Chashuv Bifnei Atzmo, that these two, verses constitute an independent book. Independent book? Interesting. In fact, it continues and it says that Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, citing a, a verse in the book of Proverbs, that wisdom built its house and its house rested on seven pillars, okay? He interprets this homiletically to refer to, and look at this, right? Shiva Sifre Torah. Not the five books of the Torah, but the seven books of the Torah. Because if in fact these two verses are an independent book, it means that whatever precedes them in the book of Bimidbar, is a separate book, and whatever follows them in the book of Bimidbar is a separate book, which means that the book that we call Bimidbar consists not of one book, but actually consists of three books. Okay, so those three, together with Breshit, Shmod, Vayikra, and Devarim, would make up a total of seven, which is clearly just a homily and, and not really more than that. The very last item <clears throat> on our agenda for this evening is something called Tikkunei Soferim. Three Midrashim, the Mechilta, the Sifrei, and the Tanchuma, all venerable Midrashim, right, record among them 18 instances, not in the Torah alone, but throughout the 24 books of Tanakh, of a phenomenon that they call Tikkun Soferim. Literally, Tikkun is to correct a mistake. So fair is a scribe. So literally, the word tikkun sofrim means a scribal emendation or correction, okay? Nevertheless, as we'll see in a moment, the term was understood traditionally not to be an actual correction of a mistake or a physical change in the text, but rather was understood to be a figure of speech that designates a euphemism. Here's the example. <clears throat> you may remember the story of Abraham extending his hospitality to his three guests. And after he feeds them, it says that they turned away and they headed towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before God. Now, if you remember the story, right? God appeared to Abraham at the very beginning by Yerah Hashem al Avram, right? Avraham, God, God appeared to Abraham. But after that original appearance of God, right, Abraham runs to greet his guests. He goes to give instructions to Sarah. He goes to give instructions to his household. He feeds his guests. So, what's this business about Abraham still standing? 
before God? He wasn't standing before God. Actually, the way the rabbis read the text is that when God and Abraham were talking to each other and Abraham saw that, that he had visitors, Abraham said to God, excuse me, I have to go extend my hospitality to my guests. The rabbis say, Gedolah hachnasat orachim mikabalat pnei hashechina. This teaches us that extending hospitality is, takes precedence even over speaking to God. So at that moment in time that Abraham turned away from God to go take care of his guests, what was God doing? The rabbis say that what God was doing was God was standing there waiting for Abraham to finish his, his, uh, his duties as a host and then resume their conversation. So to actually, the verse should have said, Hashem odenu omed lefnei Avraham, that God was still waiting for Abraham. But that was considered to be unseemly. Right? And therefore, from the very moment that the Torah was written, it was written as though it were Abraham who was still standing before God, not that a text was altered or amended, but rather from the very beginning, it spoke euphemistically, indirectly. Same example, another example here, but we don't have time. Um, the actual form that Masoretic Notes takes consists of two apparatuses. One is called the Misora Ketana, Lesser Misora, and that appears, it's, it's a series of abbreviations that appear in the margin of a printed text of Tanakh. And the other is called the Misora Gedola, the greater Masora. And that consists of explanations of the abbreviations. And it appears in one of the other upper or lower margins of a printed text. Here's an example. I uh, show you. Um, the example is coming from a book that I happen to have on my shelf. I, 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 the, only, the only text of Tanakh that I happen to have that has Masoretic notes is a, an, a, a, uh, an edition of uh, Sefer Tihilim, which as you can see was published in Venice in 1618. And here is the opening page right, the very first chapter of the book of Psalms. So you can see on the bottom, on the right-hand side is the Masoretic text. Ashrei ha'ish asher, sorry, it was cut off. Lo halach ba'atzat reshaim uvedera chataim lo amad, et cetera, right? To its left, right, the left-hand column is the Aramaic Targum of Psalms. In the middle, between those two, you can see abbreviations, right? There's a letter bet on the top line. The, below it, there is a letter dalit, a letter kaf, right? A bunch of abbreviations, okay? So here are the abbreviations that you would find in a comparable text accompanying the very first pasuk of the Torah. Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. You'd find the following notes. You'd find a letter he. Following it, you'd find a letter gimel, then the words Rosh Pasuk, then another Gimel and a Lamed. That's the Misorah Tana. That's the abbreviated way. The Misorah Gedola explains, right, elaborates on those abbreviations and tells us that the He means that the word Breshit appears five times in the Bible. Of those five times, Gimel, three of them, Rosh Pasuk, are at the very beginning of a verse. As it is here at the beginning of the Torah. And then it tells you what those verses are. Breshit bara Elohim, right? Then Breshit mam lachot and Breshit mam lechet. Again, it doesn't give you all the information, but if you had a concordance, you could find them. And what about the two remaining uses of the word Breshit? Those are Be'emtza. That's where the word Breshit appears not at the beginning of a Pasuk, but somewhere else in the Pasuk. Again, in those same verses. Okay. And finally, you see on the bottom of the page, 
the uh, word gimel, the letter gimel, uh, tells us that the phrase Bavra Elohim appears three times in the Bible. And the Lamid is perhaps even the most, the most interesting of all of the Masoretic notes. The Lamid is an abbreviation for the Aramaic word leta, which means no is. Okay, And that tells us that a word or a combination of words that are marked Masoretically with the Lamid means that that word or that combination of words appears nowhere else in Tanakh. And there we are for this evening. I will take a quick look. Oh, I have this problem again that I haven't been able to solve. You'll forgive me. It'll take me a moment because I cannot um, somehow on my computer, the, the chat got scrunched. So I don't get I more than read. four letters on a line. I can read the questions if you'd like. Oh, please. Thank you. Okay. All right, I guess I can ignore my comment, but I really, I'm assuming the Yemenites, they still read the Shu, the, the Targum in Aramaic, right? Oh, yes. The Yemenites, usually it's, usually it's a boy, it's a boy of, of about bar mitzvah age who, mm. who follow, who accompanies the, the, the Kore and, and, mm. and, and there's a, there's a, there's trap for the Targum also, meaning it's read musically. So I have to go to Yemenite shul, but uh, yeah, Not yeah. Not every but, Yemenite shul will have it. Yeah, I mean, that custom, of course, is a Talmudic custom that went for a long time, but now I think they're the Yemenites, the only one who keep it going. Okay. Um, okay, which version is more correct, the Kri or the Kriv? Well, according to the Radak, it, it shows basically that the sources were split on it. Okay. I, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that the one that they want you to read, to recite, may have been considered slightly more authoritative because they were clearly more concerned about the proper recitation of the text. Because remember that likro in biblical Hebrew does it means, means to recite. When we say read something, our automatic assumption is that you're going to cite read it. In fact, you may remember from school that you were probably criticized on one occasion or another. Why are you moving your lips when you're reading? So we have to remember that in biblical Hebrew and not only biblical, in, biblical, in the biblical period, but halachically, anything that's supposed to be read halachically has to be recited. So I'm assuming that whatever version they wanted you to recite was the one that they somehow thought was slightly more authoritative. But that's just I, my... I, I would think it's connected to the Machloket and Masechet Sukkah, Yeshem Lemikra, Yeshem Lemasoret. In other words, which uh, the Gemara has that debate by how many was you need in a, in, in a Sukkah. Do you read it with the Vav or without the Vav? Sukkot spelled with or without a Vav. How you pronounce it or how it's written. So I don't know. Yeah, you don't that's, think that's, that's connected? Usually, that's usually when the difference is one of the Imota Kriya. I, I, I think it's really different if the, if the difference is in vocalization and not in the consonantal text. But anyhow. Okay. Um, iPad wants to know, okay, I'm, I guess changing the Torah text, not because it's scribbled up, but to reflect textual in, interpretation. Or, or what came first here, I think. I think that's the question. But the idea that here you have uh, the text was changed by Chazal or by, by somebody, um, you know, to... No, no again, the, according to the Radak's explanation and according even to the explanation that's provided for Tikkunei Sofrim, no text was ever changed. The understanding that a Tikkun Sofrim is not a change in the text, it is the use of, of a euphemistic speech. But nevertheless, if you want to know more about correcting, fixing text, I refer you to the work of my colleague, Barry Levy, called Fixing God's Torah. I have in the back of you, right, okay. All right. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I'll just ask you, the, the right, that clearly doesn't hold like the Rambam in terms of uh, our biblical text. I mean, that's rather obvious. He can't hold like the Rambam, that the, the Torah text that we have today is the same one given at Sinai. With, I mean, that's, of course, a much you know, broader topic, but the Radak basically says black and white. We lost our Masora. And uh, the dots, I mean, while you were talking on the dots, I pulled out um, 
Weiss Halivni's book, you know, you have Shadow Drush, um, which I read about 25 years ago, you know, David Livni Weiss. Uh, are you, you're, you're familiar with this, Dr. Sokolow? I assume you have it too, yes, on a classic. This is uh, Plain and Applied Meaning in Rabbinical Lexi Jesus, right? Okay, so this is uh, where he has a long discussion. I haven't read it in 20 years. I'll have to take a look at it again. But of course, he goes into great that, that, um, that Pirke, the Avot the Rabbi Natan obviously is very controversial. They don't like it in the yeshiva world because it doesn't uh, flow with the current uh, theological assumptions of how the Torah were put together. But okay, anyways, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank the Almonds again. And uh, if I can, I'm going to make a plug. I haven't done it uh, it's towards the year end. If uh, anybody would like to make a, a donation, that would be greatly appreciated. The sponsor class, or low, whatever, whatever you can do, I think is greatly appreciated. I just put a link to the donate page. And uh, as you know, all our classes are offered free of charge, but they don't run for free of charge. So uh, if you can, those who have given, we thank you very much. And uh, we appreciated all donations. And uh, most of them, we look forward to learning with you and your friends. And please invite them tomorrow night. Uh, Rav Aviyat Tabori, he uh, wants to get up at three o'clock in the morning to give the Shir 3.30 live from a lunch fruit. That's uh, his choice. So uh, that's tomorrow. Rav Aviyat Tabori will be giving the Shir 8.30 on Parshat Shemot. We've entered the next book of the Torah, of course. And then Friday morning at 9 a.m., I'll be continuing my Shir on the Sitter. So everybody's welcome and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Everybody should be well, should be safe. I just saw the British uh, first study, I think, came out that Omicron is uh, less severe, which we've all been hoping for. Let's hope it's really true and uh, that all the increased cases won't mean increased uh, people who are sick. OK, everybody, we will. Thank you very much. Lila Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank, thank you again, you. Rabbi Amin. OK, thank you.